Hello, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are located in this world, and welcome uh, to the ninth webinar of the Bioencapsulation Research Group. My name is Stefan Drusch from Technical University of Berlin in Germany, but I'm probably uh, the least important person this afternoon. My job is to guide you through this webinar. And more important, our two speakers who are with us, uh, Jenny Weisbrot from Simrise AG in Germany and Sibing Chang from University of Birmingham, the speakers of today's webinar on microcapsule characterization. First of all, some technical aspects. So as you can read on the bottom of this slide, we, we have two ways to communicate. There's a chat uh, function in the Zoom and please use the chat function only for technical problems. So we have uh, Denis and Brigitte Poncelet taking care of those problems and trying to solve them together with you. In terms of scientific questions or questions related uh, to the presentation, please post them through the question and answers window uh, in the Zoom software. And I, I will try to compile them, uh, sort them, and uh, provide them uh, after the talk uh, for the discussion. Maybe you're already familiar with the BRG series of webinars. I, I told you that it is the ninth webinar we have today on particle characterization. And this webinar series is jointly organized by the Bioencapsulation Research Group and uh, an EU-funded Horizon 2020 project called NCAP for Health. So the BRG is, I think, the largest uh, association dedicated uh, to microencapsulation and bioencapsulation. We are usually communicating uh, through conferences, training schools and industrial conventions. And as you see on the left hand side, outreach is quite far. We have uh, 7,000 contacts we are reaching uh, with the posts and with all our information. We, we are present in the social networks like LinkedIn, where we have 2,500 members. And as you see on the next slide, there are some exciting new events uh, this year. So first of all, today we are talking about particle characterization, but uh, the series of webinars will continue. Next one is in May on microencapsulation and pickering held by Claire Breton Carabin from INRA and Romain Bolz from Chama University. Uh, later on in the year, you can expect also other webinars, for example, on dripping technologies and on scale up of microencapsulation uh, technologies. Then in May, uh, hopefully uh, with a high number of participants and hopefully uh, on site, uh, there will be the 21st, uh, 24th, fourth microencapsulation industrial convention where you, you can experience different talks, but uh, more important, you have uh, the opportunity to, to meet people from science, from industry, uh, discuss your problems in B2B meetings, which is a very nice format I can only recommend. And later on in the year, in June, uh, there's going to be the 27th International Conference on Bioencapsulation. This year, it's going to be held in Marseille in France. For more information and registration, uh, you can visit uh, the website of the Bioencapsulation Research Group. Okay, moving uh, to, the, to today's seminar on uh, particle characterization. Our first speaker is, uh, as I already said, Jenny Weisbrot from Sumrise. You may know her. She already gave a seminar or a webinar some time ago on encapsulation by spray drying, which was, I think, very successful. We had a high number of participants during uh, the webinar, and uh, you can watch all the uh, past webinars on YouTube, where I think she collected so far up to 3000 views. So uh, it was obviously a very interesting uh, presentation. Jenny studied food technology at the University of Bonn in Germany. De she's dealing with microencapsulation for more than 20 years and uh, for now 11 years. 
she's in a leadership position uh, as a technology scout and um, or leading the technology scouting and development group uh, at Zoomrise, uh, one of, uh, I think, the world's largest um, producers of flavors and fragrances with headquarter in Holzminden. And therefore, we are really happy that uh, Jenny is now sharing some practical thoughts on uh, particle characterization uh, with relevance uh, for the industry. So Jenny, it's a pleasure to have you here again. Thank you very much. And you may much. take over the screen and start your presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. We will start to tell you something about the impact of characterization of microcapsules on industrial applications. So how will we go through this talk? We will talk about how or why characterizing particle properties. We will talk about particle or powder properties. We start with the particles, go over to the bulk properties and come up with some conclusions. So why should we can generally characterize particles because they have a direct uh, relationship with processes and products. Our particle properties are directly correlated to product quality and offer the possibility to control our processes because if we are monitoring our particle properties, we will directly see if our pro process went wrong or well. They have a direct impact on any kind of downstream processes. For example, the flowability. Flowability of powders is very important for dosing and transportation in the upstream processes. The mechanical properties of our particles, for example, are very important for blending. And the particle shape, structure, and even the roughness of the surface is very important for agglomeration and coating processes. Our particle processes adhere too to the physical product stability as it is transport or shelf life. And they affect the release of actives, which in much cases or many cases is the most important reason to monitor our particle properties. And last but not least, the particle properties, size, shape, flowability, again, correlate directly to safety, which means the amount of dust I have in my product, the burning rate it will have in total, or the explosion values. So what are we talking about, about particle or powder properties? This just depends on the question you have to answer. Is it more for the detail? Do you have to know how big is your single particle? How is the shape? Is the surface more rough or more smooth? How is the density or the microstructure of the single particle? Or how are the mechanical properties? Will it withstand the upstream processes like mixing, blending, kneading, whatever is done in the following process steps? Sometimes we have the problem to distinguish between particle and powder properties. And this is true for um, the mechanical properties, especially, because sometimes it's not possible for very small particles in my department at least, Professor Zhang is more professional on this. He will be able to do this, but for the very small particles, I'm not able to measure the mechanical properties. So sometimes I need to go to the powder properties and look, for example, at the abrasion resistance or at flow properties or compressibility to characterize the mechanical properties of my, my particles indirectly by looking at the powder properties. If we are going for the size distribution evaluation in powders, sometimes it's not the single particle which is interesting, it's more the size distribution. Is it broad or is it very narrow? Do we have a lot of dust small particles inside or do we have some bigger particles inside which can lead to the conclusion that something went wrong within my process, just leading to a kind of agglomeration which is not wanted. Of course, the bulk density and porosity is very important if, I'm, if it comes to, to uh, my powders because this determines at least on, in the simplest way your packaging. Yeah? The dust index is very important if it comes to contamination within your whole production plant. And it even has a big influence on the explosion classification numbers, which coming more and more important in the powder industry. So, Let's go for the particle properties. The particle size 
at first has a direct influence on reactivity, shelf life, hygroscopicity, because the particle size is directly related to the free surface, the surface of your particles, the surface of your powder. Of course, it influences the particle size, influences the dissolution rate too, but not the particle size by itself, even in combination with the shape and, for example, the microstructure of your particle. Very important for many applications is the sedimentation and dispersions. For example, for many um, pharmaceutical products, it's very important that the active stays dispersed homogeneously in application. And the viscosity is directly influenced by a smaller, the smaller the particle, the higher will be the viscosity in dispersion. The delivery rate quite Interesting, again, for pharmaceutical applications here, the smaller is the better, the faster delivery. So some of the retard formulations, for example, have a range of particle sizes, the small ones for the direct delivery and bigger ones for delayed delivery, so that the pharmaceutical or the vitamins or whatever is applied just deliver for a longer time period. If it comes to food, texture and mouthfeel is influenced by a particle size. If you have a liquid or semi-liquid uh, food and you apply particles bigger than 30 microns, you will directly have a sandy feeling on your tongue, which is in most cases not desirable. The smaller the particle, the lower will be the flowability and the more complicated will be the handling, at least in the whole following process steps. And the shelf life is enormously influenced by the particle size because again, we have the free area. So when we are talking about particle size, normally we are working with a kind of a, yeah, equivalent diameter, which means that we, when we are measuring something, we just calculating a sphere which has the same, for example, maximum length or minimum length. If you look at this irregular shaped particle I painted on here, you can see that this might lead to different particle sizes if you calculate a sphere with a minimum length or with a maximum length of this particle. The particle size can even be calculated based on a behavior, for example, on a sedimentation velocity or on a sieving size. This all has to be taken into consideration when you're looking for the right method to determine your particle sizes. And this will be explained in more detail with the following um, pictures. The first picture shows a spray dried product, which does not went really well, because you see a wonderful sphere here, but all the other parts are more or less like broken glass. And this is a non, not wanted agglomeration, which, which happens in here. So we wanted to have a discrete particle, but we have an unwanted agglomeration. The next picture shows a wanted agglomeration. This is an agglomerated spray dried product. You see the primary particles. And with this product, it's easy to demonstrate that you have to be careful in measuring your particle size because just imagine you will make a sieve analysis with these kind of particles. If you have a part or a sieve size of let's say 200 microns, this particle, if it comes in this direction, will not pass through. But if it falls down on the sieve with this part, it can pass. So whatever comes out of our particle size measurements very often is a distribution, and this has to be taken into consideration. It's not a discrete number. Even more complicated, it can go for particles like that. This is a vacuum dried product, and it looks again like broken glass. This is typical for these kind of products. So how to measure particle size here? If you go for a sieving analysis, you will destroy more than you get results. Even in Malvon, any kind of laser diffraction will not really work. So in some cases, it might be the only way to go for the microscope and count thousands of particles, which, is which can be automatically done, of course. When you go for the downstream process, it's very important to look what you have to work with. And this is why I put this picture in here. This is a tea leaf 
which has to be um, coated. So you see, it's a very irregular surface. You have indentations, it's folded, you have holes in there. So to really apply a completely dense coating will be not able when you're not applying hundreds of layers on here. How a particle can fit perfectly in its application can be seen on the next picture. You see here a fabric softener um, on a towel, applied to a towel. And you see these wonderful small capsules filled with perfume fit perfectly between the fibers of this towel, stay there and just open piece by piece so that your fabric stays fresh for a long time. The next particle is a composite. It's a pressed, a compactate um, made of different, composite, uh, different components. We have a sugar in here, we have citric acid, and we have uh, yeah, a fruit juice concentrate, which is pressed together to give a kind of, a, let's say, a, um, yeah, recomposited, a recomposite uh, strawberry, something like that. And you see that the particles completely dense, the surface is rough, the form is irregular, but you don't see any holes or cracks. So the process went perfectly well. Next is a bead, the only perfectly round particle I have in here. And you can look, the surface is a little bit rough, but the shape is perfectly round. So the formulation and the process went well. I don't see any active on the surface. So a nice round, perfect capsule. And the opposite is here, anything but perfect. It's a broken, you see just broken glass. It's a spray dried a product which we uh, overheated just to show what can happen if you overheat a spray drying process or the particles more or less exploded. And this is a wonderful picture of a process went wrong. So you've seen it's, it's quite difficult to, to get a particle size distribution or get an idea of your particle size um, without uh, with, with excluding additional information you can only get by optical methods. So you should always know the exact form, shape, and surface structure of your particles before go on uh, with the examinations. The problem with these techniques, which just depict your size distribution by number, is that you don't get, really get a quantification. You just get counts, more or less, with these methods. If you really want to know how many percent of your particles are in a class between 10 and 100 micron, you have to use these techniques, but there you can't go really to the low particle sizes, to the smaller particles. They are limited to the bigger ones. So whenever you have to, to check for the best possibility, you should check the question you have to answer first. If you are looking at the microstructure of a particle, um, normally when we are talking about the density, we are talking about the effective particle density, which means we have a particle including all its open and closed pores. But sometimes it's a good idea to even know how big or how many pores I really have within my particle because all these pores represent an open area, open space for oxidation, for example, or other degradative processes. So pa uh, pycnometry is a good method to measure the particle uh, density, but in many cases, we will end up more with the apparent and not the true particle density because just depending on the material used for encapsulation of your active, uh, your fluid, either liquid or a gas, will not be able to really penetrate all the closed pores so that you really get the true particle density, which means just the closed material of your particle. In some cases, it might be helpful to measure the apparent particle density, so without destroying the particles. After that, grinding the particles and measure if there's a difference, and then you get a good idea how many closed pores your particle might have and how your density or microstructure really is. 
just a very short look on the mechanical properties because Professor Sang will do this in, in detail and more professional than I can. This is just what we are doing with the bigger particles. We are very limited to the bigger ones. Um, we put our particles between a, a compression cylinder and a platform, and then we apply a defined force or we go for a certain distance representing 80% deformation of the particle. And so we can look for a rupture point, the force we need to rupture this particle all the way we have to go until a rupture occurs. This might be very interesting for some particles which really break and need to open um, to release something on pressure. For example, flavor in a chewing gum. We want to have this flavor burst in our mouth. And if the particle does not break on chewing, um, we, we, sh we should not need to put this into the chewing gum. But on the other hand side, the chewing gum production is a very rough process with a very hard needing shear forces. And the particles have to withstand these forces first. So with these methods, we are able to evaluate if our particles are more elastic, more plastic. When they will break, you can see different deformation curves here for some of our particles from elastic to partial rupture to a complete rupture of the particles. So moving back from the single particle coming to the powder properties, at first I will start with the particle size distribution again. So the simplest way to do this, of course, is the sieving analysis. And if you refer to a Dean Iso norm and uh, follow or, or buy the tips you will read there, you will really be able to get very reproducible results. In these norms, the factors influencing the receiving results and all the setup of the receiving trials is described in detail. And so it's a very good method to use for the bigger particles, of course. Instead of a normal microscopy, you can, of course, use a flow microscopy. <coughs> Pardon? Um, here in this case, um, we weren't expecting to have bigger particles. So I just made a cutout within this uh, measurement and uh, just looked at the bigger particles and found out that they are all agglomerates. <coughs> so um, sedimentation analysis is very special, at least uh, applied to very special uh, questions. Um, for example, wastewater cleaning, something like that. What is used very often is static and dynamic light scattering. I depicted um, dynamic light scattering here, and these are curves of the same um, material. Very surprising what we can see here, the red and the green one are just depicting the big particles. And because we wanted to see if we have very small particles within these uh, powder, at least, we filtered them out. And when we filtered the bigger fractions out of this particle size distribution, we were able to see the smaller ones. And this is a danger using the dynamic light scattering because it depicts the particle the particles more or less by its intensity. And the bigger the particle, the higher is the intensity. So if you have some big particles, it might happen that they mask the smaller ones and you don't see them. Here, I want to just have a short comparison of static light scattering and the sieving analysis. You see, you come almost to the same results. In this case, we have particle sizes of around 550 microns with a, a static light scattering. If I go for a sieving analysis, I see, yes, the main part is on 500 microns. But this wasn't the question behind these methods. The question behind was the customer does not want to have any dust in its application. So you see the problem is here with a, with a, a static light scattering, you can't really quantify. So we had to figure out what is dust and how many dust can we really have in our product. And dust is something around 200 microns to be sure that we are really meeting the customer's interests. Uh, we put a tea bag and this was his application. He wanted to apply these particles to a tea bag. We put a tea bag under the microscope and measured the pores we have 
in this tea bag and came to the conclusion it's around 200 microns. So let's look how particles below 200 microns behave in a tea bag. So we put particles smaller than 200 microns in a tea bag. You can see this here and bigger ones in a tea bag. Here you see it directly blended with tea. We tapped this tea bag several times on the desk to really make or force the particles through the tissue and put it on the microscope again. And what you see here that all the smaller particles are really penetrating the tea bag, they are coming out, they will look dusty and this is what the customer wanted to avoid. Whereas the bigger particles stay inside and give a nice picture. What else can we say about particle size distribution or its impact on, part, on powder properties? You can see here, we have one recipe. Uh, we fractioned it, you know, fractionated it in, two, in three different fractions by sieving and put these different fractions into a climate cabinet for 24 hours storage at 55% relative humidity, something like you know, typical for, for European humidity. For 20 degrees C, you can see even after 24 hours, no change of the different particle fractions. They, they, nothing happened at all. At 30 degrees C, you see lumping starts in the finest fraction. And at 40 degrees C, after 24 hours, fraction one and even the middle fraction start really to show big lumps. When we were measuring this with a DSC or regiological method, we found out that the sticky point would be around 27 degrees C for the whole powder. The problem is if you have the whole powder blend, you might not be able to see the smallest fraction and how it behaves. So sometimes it might be a good idea to just fractionate your powder first and take a look at the relevant fraction because you will see here the change is much faster than in the whole powder. Coming now to the differential scanning calorimetry. Here you can see phase transitions, decompositions, chemical interactions of uh, samples like glass transition, crystallization, melting points. Uh, what we did here is a direct comparison between a mixture and a capsule. So the first mixture is just a physical mixture of our carrier, carrier material with a flavor. This is a black curve. You see, we have a glass transition temperature at 70 degrees C. What we did now is we put at least this mixture in a hot melt extruder, melted the carrier. It was the flavor was dispersed inside and uh, uh, particles were cut into little pieces. These pieces or these capsules were put into the DSC again. And when we measured the glass transition temperature, now it was just at around 60 degrees C. So our flavor, if it is processed with our carrier, has classified our carrier matrix. So even a physical uh, mixture cannot depict what will happen if you process your particles first. I talked about flow properties or just uh, let you know that I will talk about flow properties. There are different methods to measure them, shear cell or flow cell. The principle is almost the same. You fill a beaker uh, with your powder, here it is still filled, and you have an instrument which will go inside these powders, stirring or moving and measuring the resistant force to move the respective um, instrument. I put a just short graph or yeah, evaluation in here. Here we have some easy flowing um, powders. You see a very low force, uh, small force is needed to move these instrument inside the powder. And this was a very sticky caking powder. And you see how many or oh, much more force is needed to move um, the instrument within the powder. Of course, there are other traditional methods, of course, for example, the angle of response, but it might be a bit difficult for the powder to flow out this funnel first if, you, if it's still sticky. And then this method might be a little bit complicated. Another way might be the Hausner ratio, 
which uh, sets a relation between a bulk density and a stamped bulk density. And if you don't watch the stickiness or the flow properties of your powders, this can happen in production. You see a blender completely covered with sticking powder. If you open it up, everything will be contaminated. You see a fan completely blocked. You see a spray dryer completely covered uh, within the sensors, which don't really measure anything with it's looking like that. Some other methods to evaluate your powder or your microcapsule properties might be friction or abrasion analysis, especially important if your microcapsules are blended afterwards with tea, with a soup, a sauce, or something like this, any kind of instant food. You need to know if there is any abrasion which can, for example, destroy your capsule. You put it in a little blender, the charm of this apparatus is just it's, it's transparent, you can look inside and look what happens. Here you see a tea blend with some white flavor particles inside. You let it just work for a defined time or number of, of courses, uh, just representative for your industrial process. And afterwards you put all everything on a sieve and just for example, a 200 micron sieve, and then you weigh how many fines have been developed uh, throughout this process. The stamp density can be used, for example, to simulate a transportation. If your product is transported over land for thousands of kilometers, you might have a kind of a densification. In this case, you fill your cylinder, it's a normed cylinder with your um, particles or with your mixture, whatever you want to test. And then it's stamped on the desk with a defined frequency and amplitude. And um, afterwards, you can see how much it densifies. The compressibility, very important for a tableting, for example. And even if you apply uh, microcapsules to a tablet, it can um, yeah, influence your tableting, at least, so your compressibility. So you make a blending of your carrier and your microcapsule and put it in an in instrument and apply a specific force or to, to go for a, for a defined way to compress the tablet to a defined height. And then again, you have your compression curves where you can see how much it can be compressed and how much force is needed to compress the tablets. And afterwards, you can, of course, measure how firm this tablet is. And again, the, cab uh, the climate ca uh, cabinet. In this case, I just wanted to see, I uh, wanted to, to show how temperature can influence the caking of your powder. You see up to 35 degrees C, everything might be nice, but then your, part, uh, your powders might start lumping, melting, and are not usable at all. <laughs> the higher temperatures. And don't think 50 degrees C to 60 degrees C will never happen to my product. If you ship your product, for example, to Asia, this will happen. Of course, in a container ship, you have temperatures up to 60 degrees C. So coming to the dust analysis, um, dust analysis at least is a dust sedimentation analysis based on, based on Stokes' law. Our fluid is air in this case. And this analysis sets the particle size in di direct uh, yeah, correlation to the sedimentation time. You put your powder in here, it falls down into the reaction or measurements uh, chamber. In here, we have LED lights, which go through the sample. At first, when the sample falls down, a dust cloud will develop, uh, develop. You can see it in here. It's a highest peak at the beginning. And then the powder starts to sediment. And this is why this method measures over 30 seconds of sedimentation of the fines uh, within the measurement chamber. In this case, a rework was done because this powder, the first one, the lilac curve, leads to a strong contamination within the production line. And uh, it was a little agglomeration was applied to, to just lower, especially the fines from green to red in this curve, you can see. And what you see with the dust value, you see the, the first the dust cloud was not so intense as for the original product. 
and the sedimentation was much faster. So the contamination was reduced. And you even have to take in consideration if you have a very dusting product, it even contaminates the breathing air, which is very dangerous for the workers which are handling the powders. And you need much more cleaning times and the risk of explosion even is higher, which I can show which my last slide. I just depicted the dependency of particle size and explosion classification numbers here. There are a lot other a lot, a lot more particle or powder properties which are in discussion having an uh, influence on explosion parameters like density, molecular weight, specific surface area, and so on. Um, but here, just for the particle sizes, on the left-hand side, you always have a bigger particle size on the right-hand side, a smaller particle size. These two powder heaps were lighted at the same time, and you see the first one just stops burning immediately. The second one really continues burning uh, with a very high velocity. And this is just a matter of particle size. The uh, dependency of particle size with a minimum ignition energy is also known. You see uh, the blau blue curve here has a very low ignition uh, energy of just 60 millijoule, which is almost just a little spark of static energy. And the red curve with the bigger particles need much more energy to be ignited. And even the intensity of an explosion will differ if you have more fines in it, less fines here, more fines, a very intense explosion. This is a field of research where a lot of work I think needs to be done. And uh, for anyone who's interested and want to start with it, I put just some literature in here to start thinking about this topic. So to conclude, should we measure particle and powder properties? Of course, but we should be aware which question should be answered because otherwise we are just yeah, producing data. We don't really need to answer our questions. There are a lot of measurement methods available which we can adjust with the parameters within these methods to directly answer our questions so that we can come to more reliable quality of our capsules. We have a better process control. We will have a safer handling at least. And the make the, we will make the downstream processes much more predictable. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, Jenny. Thank you very much. As usual, a pleasure to listen to you uh, with all the practical applications uh, <laughs> with your long experience in the industry. So uh, we are ready. We have some minutes for discussion. And actually, I have a very general one because um, on, on one hand, so, so you, you you showed us methods where, where you're doing some assumptions, like particles are spherical, but they are not. On the other hand, you have particle properties like surface oil. On one hand, you want to see how they affect the powder properties, like for example, the flowability or things mm -hmm. like that. But for other analyses like surface area determination, they are probably just, just causing mistakes. So, so the question, my, my very general question is, do, do you think that those assumptions and maybe those individual factors uh, uh, varying from sample to sample lead or, or uh, limit you in interpretation of your results? Or, or are you in daily routine if you want to, to go from analysis to real life behavior of your powders? Or is that all factors which are negligible in uh, in daily routine? I think in, in daily routine, we, we just make a lot of effort to really come to the right conclusion how our shape and, uh, influences, for example, the surface oil. So uh, we are playing with all the parameters we have within our measuring methods to come as near as possible to the right physical explanation. So this is why I put a lot of microscopic pictures in there. I think uh, 
one quarter of our time, we are just staring in a microscope and try to figure out if, I, if our method is really properly working. Okay, uh, especially when uh, thinking of your first slides, I'm sure half of the people attending the webinar will now think about buying a new microscope. <laughs> that was a really <laughs> nice picture. <laughs> okay, we, we have some questions in the chat. The first one is, when determining the particle size manually by analyzing microscopy images, what is the best approach regarding minimum particle count? <laughs> I would say 10,000, but who is patient Ooh. like that? <laughs> yes, this is, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of determining a, a particle size distribution by microscope. Yeah, it, it, because you, you need really a high number to get a reliable result because just the sampling is crucial. Yes, you, you take a sample just from above, from your sample, then you might have some bigger particles. If you shake it well, you might have the real distribution or not. Or you, you, you're never sure if you're just counting a few particles, if it's a representable uh, powder or a representable sample. Yeah, I, 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 I can agree on that <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> so the next one is on the sedimentation test. Mm -hmm. you, you explained it was conducted against air. Can it be also evaluated against the liquid? Uh, yeah, this is done, for example, in, in wastewater cleaning. There is normally the liquid, the, the fluid. But I, it was just the, the apparatus I was presenting, and we were talking about powder. Uh, properties and in this case it's easier to use just the air and the apparatus which is available but of course you can do it in a liquid if you know uh, for example if you make a wastewater cleaning you know the properties of your of your liquid exactly then you ha would have been or you would have better results to do this in the right liquid okay uh... Uh, finally, I, 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 need, I need to add, uh, Jenny, that all, all, all the questions coming through the chat, they acknowledge the great presentation you did, so I, I don't want to skip that part of the, of the messages. Uh, next Thank one you. is uh, possibilities to avoid lumps to get better flowability for dosing, for example, without changing the microcapsules. Are there any methods? There so are probably the no agglomeration desired. <laughs> the addition of flow agents, I think it's an industrial practice. Normally, you just add some flowing, uh, free flowing agents, which is normally a, a silica um, that really makes your particle free flowing. But um, more and more, these silica are coming or uh, falling under discussion because of the nanomaterial in food. It will be in pharmaceutical industry, I think, even uh, yeah, increasing demand. Um, we have some experiments are done with, for example, starches, native starches, to to yeah make a powder free flowing again. Okay. And the next question we we have uh, from Talita. Uh, so, uh, I guess you get part of the answer in the next presentation. So, it's regarding fracture mechanisms and deformation. How do you measure it for particles in the micrometer scale? Oh, I will just lead over to our absolute expert who will <laughs> really explain this in detail better than I could. <laughs> Professor Zhang will do this perfectly, I'm quite sure. <laughs> Okay, and the last question before we move to the next presentation is about nanoparticles and materials soluble in water. So uh, what are suitable techniques uh, for particle characterization in that case? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question right. The particles are nano in size yeah. and they are maybe soluble in water. Yes, <laughs> this was yeah <laughs> one question we had too, <laughs> because you have to to uh, measure them in a solvent. Um, you can try to do it in isopropanol or in oil. You just have to first figure out in which um, a, a dissolvent, not a solvent, a liquid in which the particles absolutely not dissolve, because otherwise you will never catch them. 
uh, and this is the first task to do. And yeah, we are meeting these problems too in many cases. Yeah. Yeah. Finding a non solvent. Mm -hmm. Sometimes ethanol is enough. Sometimes you have even moved yeah. to non more non polar uh, liquids. Yeah. Okay. So that, that was a obviously the most urgent questions and we move uh, over to the second presentation so we are now going into more detail on the mechanical properties of individual particles and it is a pleasure to have Zibing Sang with us from University of Birmingham um, as you can see from the CV on the right hand side obviously Chemical engineering is his passion from from the Bachelor of Science to becoming a full professor and now for several decades in the field, he is a true chemical engineer and leading uh, so obviously dedicated his research uh, to particle technology to micro manipulation of uh, particles and also micro encapsulation. That's why he is also uh, in contact with, with the bio encapsulation research group. He is obviously a very, 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 very expert. That's why we are happy to have him with us. So he published more than 190 papers in that field, uh, only counting the peer-reviewed ones, uh, numerous more book chapters and uh, other types of publications. He, he has been guest and invited guests in, in a multitude of um, conferences on national and international level and so we are very happy that you are with us uh, today and we are looking forward uh, to your talk. Uh, hello everybody, um, it's my great pleasure to give this talk. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Denise Poinslate who invited me uh, to, to, to give this presentation. As Stefan said, I'm based at the University of Birmingham United Kingdom. Uh, uh, I've been working in this university for more than 30 years. I'm a fellow of the Royal Academy for Engineering, uh, FIENG, which is a, a very prestigious title uh, and the highest qualification any engineer can get in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, we also have a center for formulation engineering in our school, um, which was set up in 2000. Uh, uh, we have a mission to deliver uh, functional molecules to the right place at the right time. We've been working with uh, uh, companies uh, across a wide range of industry sectors. And my group has been working with uh, more than 40 different companies. Um, most of them are multi-billion dollar companies across the world. We are based in, in Birmingham, which is on West Midland of the United Kingdom. Or so we have uh, left, the, the UK has left uh, the EU, but uh, we are still very keen on collaborating with our uh, friends and partners in continental Europe and also in other countries. My talk, um, yeah, is outlined as follows. Um, so I'd like to emphasize the importance of measuring the mechanical properties of capsules. Uh, following Jenny's talk, uh, my, my life has been made very, very, very easy. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, I'd also like to just say a few words on the relationship between the mechanical behavior parameters and the intrinsic material properties, because in the literature, pe people normally don't have very strict classifications. Uh, and then we'll focus on the manipulation technique, which was developed in our group led by me uh, starting in 1989. Uh, now we have commercialized the instrument. Uh, we have provided many measurement services to different companies, research institutions, universities. Um, we can also supply an instrument to clients if they need. Uh, followed by uh, some mathematical numerical modeling to determine the intrinsic uh, mechanical property parameters of microcapsules uh, with case studies. We not only doing just a mechanical calculation 
In fact, my group had been doing a lot of encapsulation work over the years. Uh, I began to be involved in a BIG in 1997. Uh, we have been working with a, a wide range of companies uh, um, encapsulation, including encapsulating uh, manual formaldehyde perfume capsules, capsules for self-healing materials, uh, capsules for encapsulating peroxide for oral care, antimicrobial, antimicrobial agents for oral care, herbicide and biopesticide, uh, and different kinds of drugs, uh, and also um, probiotic cells, including bacteria in the yeast, nutraceutical enzyme, uh, flavors, vitamins, salt, and dye. Recently, we began to work on encapsulation of phase changing materials and also carbon dioxide absorbents. So, we use uh, um, different calculation techniques. And most of them are commercially available, but also we use our special technique of the micromanipulation. Now, Jenny had mentioned uh, the importance to measure the mechanical properties. Of, of particles, including capsules. Basically, yeah, we want to prevent the uh, premature damage, improves the equipment. We want to maintain the long-term mechanical stability for certain applications. Mechanical stability of a long-term is essential, for example, in calculation of phase changing materials for energy storage or artificial organs to be placed in bodies. We want the capsules to survive as long as possible. There's another very important uh, reason to characterize the mechanical properties of capsules. When we want to use a mechanical force as a trigger to achieve the control release of microcapsules for like a perfume capsules for self-healing microcapsules. Now, in literature, um, people mention the measures of force, displacement, or strain rate at time of loading. From our point of view, these parameters are considered to be mechanical behavior parameters. They are not intrinsic mechanical property parameters. Now, from these parameters are important. They need to be measured. Then from the measured data, we can infer the mechanical property parameters, which are listed on the right column. And obviously, not all the uh, mechanical property parameters are equally important. This depends on the application. For example, strength parameter can include like a compression strength, tensile strength, shear strength. Elasticity is very important, which reflects the stiffness of the material for uh, most of the softer solids, including capsules with liquid core or hydrogel materials, materials tend to be viscoelastic. So we should consider not only the elasticity, but also the viscoelasticity. Now let's just go to um, some very basic definition. Uh, people in material science area, they, they, they tend to look at a, like a relationship between stress and strain, then normally most of the materials will have an elastic region. So from the slope between stress and strain, you can determine the Young's modulus. At a greater deformation, the material become plastic. That means the materials cannot return to the original shape. Even the external node is lifted. For elastic material, uh, the stress and the strain relationship is linear, but for the viscoelastic material, the noding curve and the unnoding curve they don't overlap. There is a hysteresis, which is very important, which is a characteristic of the viscoelastic material. In literature, you may have come across with uh, several uh, measurement techniques um, for soft solids. Um, people have developed like optical tweezers, uh, micro pipette technique, atomic force microscopy, or shear flow technique. As you can see, each technique 
uh, can be applied to measure forces corresponding to um, different orders of magnitude. Generally speaking, optical tweezers, AFM, uh, can measure very, very smaller force. Um, basically, you apply a force to a um, particle, which could be a cell, could be a capsule, um, then measures the deformation. The technique we have developed at Birmingham is called a micromanipulation. Basically, we compress single particles between two parallel surfaces. We have compared all the different techniques we think our technique is much more uh, user-friendly, which can measure uh, the forces across nine orders of magnitude. And that it's in comparison with other techniques, it's more easier to use. Uh, and uh, we, we believe the data we generate is reliable. And uh, that's why we have been collaborating with not, which is, with a large number of industrial companies and the research organizations. There are, um, there are also some other techniques um, for measuring the mechanical properties of a microparticle population. For example, people compress not only a single particle, they compress a larger number of particles in a sample between two parallel plates. The data generated can be useful, but uh, it's quite not easy to compress microcapsules with a size range of say less than 10 microns. Um, people have used uh, the osm osmotic pressure technique for semi-permeable microcapsules, um, basically by changing the osmotic pressure of the suspending liquid, you can cause rupture to some capsules, which can also be used as the indicator of the capsule strength. Uh, people have used a shear device, including uh, a stirred vessel, which was used by Professor Denise Ponsolati uh, with a paper published in 1996. Um, as I mentioned, we have been focused on using manipulation technique. And also in Birmingham, my group, we have developed a nano manipulation technique for capsules or particles smaller than one micrometer. So basically for particles greater than one micrometer, we use manipulation technique. For nano particles, we use a nano manipulation technique. Obviously nano manipulation is more uh, technical demanding, which requires uh, environmental SCM uh, in compilation with a force measurement device. We published the first paper of Markman in 1991, since I came to Birmingham. Uh, but at that time, the objective was to measure mouse-to-mouse -mouse hybridoma cells uh, for preventing the damage in stood vessel for larger scale cell culture to produce multiple antibody. So we, the first version of the technique was to use a two horizontal probes. One probe was connected with a force transducer we pick up individual cells. In this case, they have a diameter of 10 to 50 microns. We squeeze it to rupture and measure the force and the displacement. Later, for smaller particles, particularly for eastern bacteria, they have a diameter from a micron to eight microns. Uh, we use a one vertical probe. In this case, the vertical probe. Uh, we build a two microscopes, one for side view, another for bottom view, so we can compress a single particle, which can be dry or can be the liquid, and then measure the force and displacement uh, after rupture. Here, there's a video clip, uh, which is showing now, uh, there's a single particle, in fact, with a mirror image. Now the probe is moving downwards, the microcapsule, metamine for multi-high capsule in this case, which was compressed to a certain point, it was ruptured, then the liquid core was released. So this right hand side is the side view, left hand side is the bottom view. Uh, after the rupture, the capsule was split into two halves. Um, so we can measure the shell thickness using the TEM or SEM if it's broken. We can do a series of experimental work to quantify different uh, 
mechanical property parameters. For example, we can do that compression and the holding. In this case, compression starts from here, then the holding. Um, during the holding, there's a very small force relaxation, uh, which is also reflected by this loading and the unloading curve. There is a, just a marginal hysteresis, which is understandable because these capsules were made of the liquid core, oil, surrounded by many formaldehyde. Um, so the whole material contains a liquid. Liquid has no elasticity. It has viscous properties. That's why the whole capsule behaved marginal viscoelastic, but it is dominated by the elastic behavior, and then plastic def deformation occurs at a larger deformation. For example, in this case, we compress it to larger deformation. Then we release the, the compression. We can see the force drop to zero before the displacement drop to zero. That means there was a permanent deformation, which is the plastic behavior. And then if you compress it further from A, to be elastic deformation, then plastic, then strain hardening, and the point C, the capsule was ruptured. As soon as it was ruptured, there was a sudden release of the force, and the force more or less dropped to zero. It's like a, 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 um, a glass wall which had been shattered. Uh, so the, sh the shell basically could, uh, went to pieces. So from the compression curve, we can determine several um, mechanical behavior parameters. We can determine the rupture force. We can determine the displacement and rupture. Uh, we also measure the diameter of the original uh, capsule before it's compressed. So we can calculate the fractional deformation. So there's a number of mechanical behavior parameters which can be obtained, rupture force uh, versus capsule size. Now, as you can see, the rupture force on average increase with the size. So the rupture force here to solve is a very important parameter, but it's not an intrinsic mechanical property parameter. Intrinsic means it doesn't depend on the size. It only depends on the chemical composition or structure of the material. The fractional deformation uh, at rupture more or less is a constant, which can be considered to be engineering strain at the rupture. In other words, the capsules also they had a different sizes, but they all ruptured at a similar strain. Now, from the basic data, force versus displacement, we can do a further analysis. Uh, people have used a Hertz model to estimate the Young's modulus of the microcapsule or microparticle. Uh, using the equation here, basically for smaller deformation, normally less than 10% of the, uh, of the fractional deformation, uh, the force versus the displacement to the power of 1.5, there's a linear relationship. So from the slope, the, you can determine the Young's modulus, R is the radius, nu is the Poisson ratio. Now, if you use this equation to apply it to the whole capsule, you can imagine you can get a Young's modulus value, but this value reflects the overall stiffness of the material, which contains a core shell structure, solid shell with a liquid core. Um, we also develop a method to determine the Young's modulus of the shell material. So we considered a capsule which is made of a solid shell with a liquid core. Liquid only has a, a viscosity. It doesn't have a Young's modulus value. Young's modulus value is zero, but the shell material it is initially it's a elastic, then plastic. In this case, we basically, we use a uh, final element analysis um, based on a software package called Abacus. So we can do the simulation of the compression and generate the stress-strain relationship. 
And then from stress strain relationship, obviously they are related to like a Young's modulus uh, for the elastic region, followed by the plastic region. You can determine the yield stress uh, at the rupture point. You can determine the stress and the strain at the rupture. Now, in terms of the how to determine this intrinsic material property parameters, we use we call the reverse engineering approach because what we obtain is a force versus displacement curve. And then we do the simulations. We generate theoretical relationship between stress and strain. Then we fit our data with the theoretical predictions to determine the intrinsic mechanical property parameters. Examples are shown here. For example, through the simulation, we could determine the force. Uh, this is a dimensional group, force divided by E, Young's modulus, I, the radius of the capsule, actually the thickness. As you can see, this group versus fractional deformation, theoretically speaking, this depends on the ratio of the shell thickness to the radius. Um, Depending on the radius, you can have a different uh, uh, curves. And if you normalize the force in the elastic region by a force at a particular value, for example, 0.1, we know normally for many moly high microcapsules, elastic region could be up to um, 0.15. So in, we know in this case, uh, we still consider the elastic deformation. As you can see through the simulation, we know the ratio of the shell thickness to radius can be determined from this force ratio. Depending on what experimental curve you get, then we can determine the shell thickness. Now, this is uh, very, very uh, important because we don't, use, we don't need to use a, a TM to measure the shell thickness for any capsule which was ruptured by our instrument. Um, we can determine the shell thickness from our manipulation data. And then from the simulation, we know the theoretical relationship between the force, Young's modulus, shell thickness, and radius, and the fractional deformation can be fitted by this quadratic equation. So we can determine the Young's modulus of the shell material after the shell thickness is knowing. Um, we can also use an even simpler method just from the force versus displacement data. Uh, using this correlation, we can, through the uh, best fitting, we can determine the shell thickness and the Young's modulus simultaneously because these are three coefficients here. They all related to the shell thickness. So using this approach, we have determined uh, one particular batch, melamine for multi microcapsules. We found the shell thickness on average was about 200 nanometers from our microvision measurements and the theoretical and numerical modeling. We also validated this value by measuring the real thickness using transmission electrical microscopy. As you can see, um, on average, they are very in very good agreement. And then we can determine the Young's modulus, the shell material, which is in several gigapascal level. Yeah, I should point out the Young's modulus value of the shell material is greater than the value determined by Hertz model. The Hertz model, in fact, considered the whole capsule as a homogeneous object which contains a liquid, which has no Young's modulus value. That's why if you only consider the Young's modulus value of the shell material, it has a much a greater value than those determined by the Hertz model. This is very important. And then we extended uh, the simulation to larger deformation uh, beyond the elastic region. Um, suppose that uh, stress and strain follow such a relationship, initially linear relationship, then perfect plastic, which means the stress doesn't increase 
but the strain increases. And we can do the simulations. We can determine the yield stress uh, by comparing our experimental data with, uh, with uh, uh, modeling results. At the larger deformation, we found with the strain hardening, the stress increased with the strain again, just before the rupture point. So from a single migration curve, theoretically speaking, we can determine a seven mechanical property parameters, the Young's modulus, uh, yield stress, uh, the, you have the plastic modulus, and the stress and strain at the rupture. Now, such the migration measurements uh, generate valuable data. The force, the rupture force corresponding to the given size itself is very valuable. Through the fine element analysis, the values of the intrinsic mechanical property parameters can be used to compare samples made of different formulations, different processing conditions, which can be linked to functionalities of the capsules. Here I'll give an example. For example, we've been working with uh, uh, Procter & Gamble to develop perfume microcapsules. Uh, basically, we started with a liquid oil. Uh, we encapsulate the oil in capsules, and then we put the capsules in detergent or fabric softeners. Uh, and through the laundry process, the capsules can be ruptured to deliver the perfume to fabric surface to consumers. In, in this case, in addition to the physical properties, chemical properties, there are three kinds of properties which are important. One is the mechanical strength, which should be optimized not too weak, not too strong, because we want to use the mechanical force as a trigger. If the capsules are too strong, they can be, can't be ruptured, there won't be any release of the oil. If they're too weak, they can be ruptured in washing machine uh, or even during the handling process, which is not desirable either. We made capsules using in situ polymerization. Um, we started our work in 2001, uh, published the first encapsulation paper on melamine formaldehyde capsules. We quantified the physical properties like a size, size distribution, structure properties like a shell thickness. In this case, we use a TM, as I said. Um, we measure the mechanical properties of the capsules which are related to the formulation and conditions. We also quantify the release rate of the oil from capsules. So we made capsules with the different formulations. So this MF means remaining formaldehyde shell. We also made the calcium carbonate shell, which is inorganic, which is more environmentally friendly. And uh, we also made a double shell capsules, which is basically the composite of melamine formaldehyde uh, with the calcium carbonate. We have found uh, the composite shell offers a very, very good protection of the oil, which uh, generated negligible leakage over a long period of time. In addition to the barrier properties and mechanical properties, we also quantify addition between the capsules and fabric surface. In this case, we use atomic force microscopy because the AFM measures the force down to um, ticker Newton to not a Newton level. Um, we have found the addition of the capsules in the liquid environment to fabric surface is in the order of several nanonewtons. And we also modified the surface of the manifold modified using a bridging molecule to enhance the deposition of the capsules on the fabric because we don't want, don't want the capsules to be washed away uh, from the clothes in washing machine. So through the optimizing the mechanical properties of the capsules, minimize, minimizing the release rate, maximizing the interactions between the um, capsules and the fabric surface. So we have 
provided assistance to Procter & Gamble and other companies to commercialize a number of products with microcapsules inside. Due to the time limit, uh, I would like to just so quickly summarize what I said. Uh, basically, understanding the mechanical properties of microcapsules, including uh, um, microparticles, including capsules, is essential to ensure the functionalities. Um, this depends on the application. For certain applications, you want the, the capsules to be as strong as possible. In some cases, you want to optimize the mechanical strength not too strong, not too weak. Uh, there are a number of techniques which can be used uh, to characterize the mechanical strengths, but we have found that the micronation technique is very uh, user-friendly. You can handle particles from submicron to centimeters if you want to, uh, which can measure the force up to nine order magnitude. Um, the data generated by the micronation itself uh, are very, very useful, but the further analysis, particularly using finite element analysis, can help you to determine the intrinsic material property parameters uh, of the particles, including capsules. Uh, for scientific research, the further data analysis is important because you want to develop in-depth understanding of how the mechanical properties can be related to the chemical composition, the structure, uh, and uh, like a cross-linking density interactions between molecules, et cetera. Finally, I'd like to mention that we have commercialized a, a new instrument through a company called Microforce Measurement Limited UK, which is a spin-off company of the University of Birmingham. So feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if you're interested in further details of the, this instrument. Thank you. Now I hand over to Stefan. Okay, great. Thanks uh, for, for, for this very nice presentation. I, I'm sure due to the time limit, it, it was it could just be a brief overview on all you did, but it was a very, very nice overview. Um, you already answer in the conclusion. You already answered one of my questions, if I got it right. Uh, so you, you can analyze with the micro manipulation up to the centimeter range. So, so there's no gap between micro manipulation and conventional texture analysis. That's right. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Another thing I did not get uh, perfectly well. Are you able to measure in a liquid environment because you are doing pictures with a microscope and things like that, because that might be of interest for some of the applicants. Yeah, we can measure particles, including capsules in liquid environment. We started our work with uh, Romanian cells. They must be in the culture medium, yeah. but as they die, they collapse. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, we are moving. Uh, we are moving to the chat. So, uh, first question, a very interesting one, which came up quite early during your presentation: If the micro manipulation can be used to analyze the behavior of a microcapsule during spray drying, so I assume it is meant uh, in terms of the stress during atomization. We can, yes. Uh, we, um, yeah, depending on the formulations, uh, we have found that spray drying can cause damage to some capsules. Uh, we measured the strength of the capsules before and after spray drying. We found that the capsules surviving the spray drying can have a greater strength. The weaker ones basically were eliminated. Okay. Okay, second question from Anand Patel from Bielefeld. First of all, congrats on the nice presentation. And what is the cost of the microparticle strength tester? Uh, this uh, uh, depends on the specifications, depending on your particle size range uh, and also the force level, because soft solids will require much more sensitive force transducers. So I'll be happy to answer this question offline. Um, to, uh, yeah. 
Okay, in that case, I move back to, to your presentation. So Anand has the chance to pick up the email address and can contact you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the last one in the chat, are there any experiences for melamine microcapsules at higher temperatures in terms of their mechanical properties? Yes, we have look, we have uh, used the environmental chamber combined with our technique to control the temperature. We can measure the temperature after the 80 degrees C. The temperature had some effect. Um, so yeah, we have done this work, but uh, uh, yeah, environmental chamber requires additional buildup around our migration rate, but it can be done. Okay, thank you very much. There are no more questions. So all left for me is uh, to thank you once again, both speakers, Jenny and Zi Bing, for, for your wonderful presentations, uh, for taking the time to discuss uh, the questions uh, which came up during the presentation. If you want to take a note of the next webinar, it is 17th of March, and it, uh, it is on microencapsulation and pickering. We hope to see all of you again. Have a nice afternoon or a nice uh, evening or again, wherever you are located, depending on your local time. And see you next time. Bye bye.